Hey, uh, welcome everybody and welcome to Virtual Friday's Dire Literary Series. And tonight, our, my guest is uh, Eileen Glenn Moore, live from Zurich. And uh, uh, welcome. And let me tell you a little bit, a little bit about her. Um, and I'll show you a little bit about her. Um, she is an America writer living in Zurich. She is the author of How Blood Works from Kent State University Press, selected by Richard Blanco for the Stan and Tom Wick Poetry Prize. She earned her MFA in poetry from Florida International University or BA in creative writing from Carnegie Mellon University. Um, her book that came out in the past year, which is really, really wonderful. Let me kind of show it to you real quick. Um, what ends up happening, this is behind the scenes stuff, I'm gonna break the fourth wall, is the Zoom stuff blocks the browser. So I have trouble, so all the stuff that I queued up um, doesn't, seem to, uh, doesn't seem to work. Um, but her book is called How Blood Works. And uh, I'm really, really happy to have her here and uh, reading from it. So uh, let's welcome uh, Eileen Glenmore. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Tim and um, everybody. I really appreciate you sharing this space with me and I'm really excited to be here. So um, I'm going to do one from the book. Um, this is called Trying to Conceive in Summer in Burgundy. In Bone, I learned that chalk in the terroir makes the wine creamy while a man who has walked the vineyards all day, feeling the ground, rubs thick mold fur from a crisp aventurine bottle. I have to sort myself out in this thirsty smattering of summer rain. Everywhere, the earthworms are making excruciating time across the pavement, beech trees shrugging off an anxious light. The gutters make monsters out of such small water. Late at night and pied-eyed on a middling Cote Nuit, I work myself over in frustration, stewing like stem and tannin in our lack of liquidity, fear of wasted time, that sinking feeling of not having fun the right way. I understand that I am talking to myself the way my mother talks to me. To muddy the theme, my parents traveled these same molten roads in their youth, and now in the vicissitudes of age and separation, each has claimed that memory as entitlement. To muddy the theme, my friend has just had a miscarriage, which the nurses have termed a chemical pregnancy, as if her hoarse voice over the phone, the terror between her words were simply a technicality. I see that I am no deep pool. I understand that the heavy clouds over crystalline gold grass are trying to tell me something vital, that I am on the banks of my own self, unsure of where to step or if I am meant to ford at all, to cross in some distant and holy sense. I'm too married to ground I've already left, too afraid of my own pleasure, these delicious anthologies, the vintner in the cellar, his sweet lollygagging dog and grandmother in slippers, the frighteningly blue sky composing itself in an instant and again and again. So um, <clears throat> this is not the final poem of the book, but it is the last poem I wrote for the book. And um, I wrote it while I was 20 weeks pregnant. And I did not write another poem for a year and a half. <laughs> I'll let you all connect the dots there. Um, but I'd like now to read the poem that I did write uh, a year and a half later, which is called Soothing My Daughter at Nap Time While Recovering from a Cold. Incidentally, I am now also recovering from a cold, so I'm trying not to cough in the middle of a line, but um, I know you'll forgive me if I can't. <laughs> Hold it in. <laughs> Soothing my daughter at nap time while recovering from a cold. And after all this coughing madness, I find myself not such a big thing anymore, whittled down as I am by shock after shock, the sore throat. I think of the ocean's bitterness as it contemplates the wake of each boat, 
the noisiness of each desire. Who thought the ocean could put its depth to such uses? Yesterday, I startled a tiny morning dove from the gravel path and into flight, or nearly, since it plummeted again and again to the earth that draws all things towards its mercurial core, which is not a metaphor after all, the earth in its infant envy having swallowed a whole planet, not exactly, but not entirely unlike Mercury, not as Kronos swallowed his progeny, but an alternate tale in which parent is devoured by child, Hestia perhaps, for who knows better the hunger of the home than the mother of all domesticity? And now we are pinned in place, not just by gravity, but by magnetism engineered by the earth's noisy appetite. And how can I not think of this staring into my daughter's enormous eyeballs made bigger by her efforts to stretch them against sleep as she cries. And I lay her on the floor beside her crib and I beside her. And as one moment swallows the next, I become aware that it is I who cries, having consumed her ire, while she reaches out and pets my stupid, wet face. For she, who began as nearly nothing at my core, is already as large as the earth. Just checking the time real quick. Okay. I'm gonna read a little bit of a longer piece. Um, this one is quite new. Um, it's on my Kindle because uh, it's so new I haven't printed it yet, which is not actually a meaningful benchmark because uh, my printer ran out of ink like six years ago. So um, a little bit of context for this poem. You might be interested to know that uh, just before the new year, I moved with my family from the United States here to Zurich. So uh, we're quite new here and this poem references that move towards the end. This is called Flowers. Approaching the summer solstice, my downstairs neighbor tells me that as a girl in Sweden, she would sweeten the shortest night of the year with seven blossoms beneath her pillow, seven unique blooms picked from the forest near her home. She has never eaten a burger before, and as I fix her a plate in my dining room, she swears that on those nights she dreamed of the husband for whom she would leave home. Her whole life before her, blooming from summer flowers beneath her head. Now she dreams of the life that's behind her, borrowing flowers from her past. Or perhaps she did not swear, and my memory has made legible something that in the moment only touched the outer folds of familiarity. Already I am planning to appropriate this ritual, borrow some of that lovely divination for the hot night ahead. It's never the dreams I want, but the sleep. Now, in this broiler of a heat wave of unknown provenance, the leaves have burned right off my summer magnolia, and my sweet William has died. And I think of that old ballad about a woman who cuts her lovely locks with a bloody sword to become the king's man, that famous flower as it goes. I didn't realize until I sat on my balcony the other night, though day collapses so slowly this time of year, the sun casting its light up over the horizon, even as its body has buried itself in the earth, I hardly think I can call it night. Listening again to that ballad sung over the steel strings of a folk guitar droning in Dorian, that the story begins with a jealous mother calling her grown daughter back to her in vain. Is it the fate of every mother to hand her daughter the knife? This is another question of legibility. The most miserable things take root in my mind. At a party last fall, before I moved across the world, I took my mother to task for asking me seven times in a row if, won't you just stay the night in the home I left 13 years ago, instead of driving home to my husband and daughter, my family as planned. And now I am the ungrateful child. Now my brother has a bone to pick with me. I look up the etymology of this phrase, because gradually picking apart the threads of the stories I weave around myself always seems like a worthy way to occupy my time. 
Think bone of contention, conjuring up hostilities between customarily sympathetic parties. Think of how a dog gnaws at a bone until it is picked over, clean, white. Think of a gathering around a table, hashing it out until marrow is sucked from the very last bone. But I've already done this, I think. In moments of despair, I send myself flowers from across the ocean, body of water connecting me to my old life through transitive property, even as it separates me in physical fact. Like all bodies, it is both real and imagined. Like my body, I mean, hewing me closely to, or from, or out of a more distant version of myself wondering what flowers of memory I will dream over tonight. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Aline. That is uh, great stuff. And I can't wait to talk to you about some of your work and some of your process. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about the uh, Stan and Tom Wick Poetry Prize? Yeah, it's, it's oh, where to start? So the uh, Wick Poetry Center is this, amazing institution at Kent State University. This is this is a shirt, a sweatshirt. Um, nice shirt. Sure. Um, Wic, Wic Poetry Center. Um, but they their mission is to sort of engage the local and national community um, with poetry. And so they have a number of programs to sort of bring poetry into the daily experience of Kent State students, residents of Kent, residents of Ohio, and you know people across the world and across the globe. Um, and so one of their initiatives is this Stan and Tom Wick Poetry Prize, which is a memorial prize for um, Stan Wick and Tom Wick, um, who are connected with Kent State University. And um, yeah, it's it, it, they're amazing. It's such a great group of people. It's such a beautiful prize. Um, as part of the prize, I went and did a short residency, uh, teaching a workshop there, gave a reading with Richard. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, a, it's a, it's a, it's a great place. And along with that, the book got published at Kent State University Press. Now, what are the advantages of getting published by a university press? Well, I think one of the great things about a university press is that there's sort of this built-in community that is the university. Um, I mean, just the fact that I had the opportunity to go to the campus and interact with students, which I always love doing, working with younger writers is, is such a joy and, and always like really inspiring in a lot of ways. Um, so, uh, you know, that's definitely a benefit. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there's so much incredible literature coming out of uh, university presses. There's sort of like this fantastic facet of like American collegiate society. And now the content of your award-winning book, uh, How Blood Works, uh, I'd read that it was based on the materials, based on an obsession you had with Joseph Albert's uh, homage to the square and his mm. artwork. Have you ever seen his artwork? I know it shows that mass mocha here, but tell me also about the process. You get obsessed with something and then works its way into a manuscript, works its way into a book. Yes. Um, yeah. So what was part of the question, have I ever seen his work or were you? Yes. Like yes. I, I guess, yeah, I went on a little tangent there. So forgive me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I, I have. Um, I mean, so I first learned about this sequence, which is now up on the screen, this homage to the square. When I was in undergrad, I, uh, I was in a poetry workshop that was being audited by a woman who worked in the design part department at Carnegie Mellon, not as a teacher, but you know, as a designer. And uh, she and I became friends and, uh, and she, mentioned this idea to me of color being its own content and she cited Yosef Albert and so um, and specifically this this sequence that he did in color studies um, so I looked it up and I just I thought it was I mean I think that they're really beautiful especially what you just put up where you could see so many of them all together at once like the, the collected feel of it I think there's something really moving about that so that idea stuck with me for a long time and when I was in grad school, 
I uh, had been playing already with different forms and in particular prose forms, um, lyric prose forms when it came to my poetry. And so as sort of my writing started to take this shape, I was put in mind again of the homage to the square, partly because of like the vessel that my work was occupying in this shape, but also because I was just curious again about this idea of like, well, what is it, what does it mean for color, which is um, a tool of art, a, a tool of expression to be its own content? And what does that, how can I kind of translate that into um, writing? You know, what, what is the sort of like ineffable tool of the craft that could just sort of stand as its own content? Um, I don't know if I successfully answered that question, but I started writing these little color studies that both played with the idea of color and image, um, but but also kind of just sort of put something out there with without trying to kind of add a logic to it beyond um, the image itself. It almost and looks I have like- seen, Yes, I've seen, in person, I've seen his work, interestingly, in Miami. <laughs> I think they have, they have one of his homages at the PAM, the Paris Art Museum. Um, and then I saw a, a piece of his in a gallery in Wynwood for sale. I couldn't afford it though. <laughs> yeah, well, well, in Mass Mocha in Western Mass, he's got entire rooms of, of work. And, and uh, but I also wanted to note that the cover of your, your book is very much like the, some of his artwork. It's obviously intentional. Um, who was the artist for the cover of your book? The artist um, is the 14-year-old daughter <clears throat> of the book designer. So I sort of uh, told her what I've been thinking in terms of the cover, and she sent me an image, and she said, would this work? And I said, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Who's the artist? Can I buy it? And she said, this is actually my, my child who did this. And uh, she, the, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go out of frame for a second here. <clears throat> because her daughter, what she painted wasn't precisely the image that made it on the cover. Her mother, the book designer, manipulated the colors a little bit, but I did eventually get my hands on the original artwork, which is hanging wow. in the office. <laughs> That's really cool to get that. Um, yeah. So it was like you're working with a prod prodigy. Um, yeah. So with, with such an interesting theme to your book, um, do you usually write from the external in, or do you also, can you also write your poems from the internal feelings and thoughts? Mm. Yeah, <clears throat> I think about this a lot, particularly lately. I, in fact, I, I recently was talking about just this with um, Julie Wade over at the Rumpus, who's also one of my, my former teachers. Um, and I think kind of, the, the self insight that I came to was that uh, I have tended to write beginning with my environment because um, <clears throat> I'm very I'm visual in general, um, but particularly when it comes to writing, um, you know, that the visual image is something that always kind of resonates with me. And so I often start with something in my environment, whether I'm in the natural world or in a city or in another space or, you know, wherever. But um, with the pandemic and lockdown, I, you know, sort of these experiences of new environments were hard to come by and, um, and just, you know, things being difficult in general. Um, <clears throat> I think at that point, I started to turn more inside of myself as a starting point, like little weird niggling thoughts that I had or um, like anxieties that would keep me up at night. Or I wrote a poem about like waking up in the middle of the night because of spider bites on my leg that I had to like reapply cortisone cream to. Um, and so it, it, it sort of changed, I think like the tenor of my work a little bit. Now, do you feel like work and like it's better or a poetry book should have themes and especially unique themes? Mm. 
No, I don't think that there's anything a book of poetry should or shouldn't be. I think that unless it's sort of a greatest hits, you know, collected works kind of thing that there's almost always going to be some sort of unifying feature to the book because I mean, for one thing, I, I there's there uh, just by virtue of the fact that a book is curated, some poems make it in and some poems don't, <laughs> um, you know, that will influence how one reads them all together. But also I think that like so much of what we write and create it sort of is a reflection of our mind and our obsessions. And, um, you know, I, I think that when you read a book of poetry, you are kind of reading what is most important to that author at that given time. And so you're bound, you're bound to sort of pick up on some themes, whether they were explicit or not. You also have a notable essay that appeared in Best American, or that was noted in Best American Essays of 2021. And the essay is called Stories My Mother Told Me. Um, are there, how many are, there, have you used that theme that you used in that essay in various poems? The idea of uh, stories being passed down? Yes, exactly. Yes, yes. I would say this is probably one of my obsessions. <laughs> The, the, that, um, yeah, that we sort of like inherit a mythology from people in our family who came before us and what, what we do with that mythology and how we might adhere to it or try to extricate ourselves from it. Um, so yeah, I, I think probably most of what I write <laughs> touches it some way on <laughs> I kept it in during the reading, <clears throat> but I won't, my cough won't be silenced forever. Um, yeah, I think I probably, most of what I write probably circles back to this idea, but more specifically that essay, uh, it, I don't know if you had a chance to read it, but um, I used this like sort of footnoting trope in it. Uh, and I, uh, as a way of offering like revision or a second way of seeing the story, that is being told in the main body of the text. And I, I wrote a follow-up essay called Stories My Father Tells, which uses that the same footnoting trope. So in that, in that way, like I did very specifically take that whole essay and kind of like import it into another piece. Now, uh, I'm also thinking too, uh, something like that. Do you think society has lost the ability to tell stories or to pass stories down? Hmm. That would be really sad <laughs> if that were true. <laughs> I'm going to say no, because I choose to be hopeful and optimistic. But surely we see evidence all around us of people sharing stories and passing them down. I think, you know, they're, they're, we, 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 have a lot of different modalities at our fingertips nowadays. Maybe, maybe we consume stories without being fully aware that that's what's happening. But, uh, but no, 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 we haven't lost the ability. We're just yeah, we're I'm, I'm hopeful too. Like, I don't want to think that my children are going to be passing down videos of the honey badger to their children. You know? <laughs> like, so much more uh, out honey there. badger. That's a blast from the past, huh? <laughs> yeah, I'm passing that story down to you. Um, <laughs> you are you are the co-founding editor of the Bath Poetry Project. Would you consider her a large influence on you? Yes, yes, I would. <clears throat> I think, yeah, yeah, I would. <laughs> now, what I do you think? I wouldn't say necessarily that my work is generally similar to her work, though I often come across, you know, lines or turns of phrases that upon revisiting, I think like, oh yeah, that's, that definitely owes a debt to Sylvia Plath. But um, I think just sort of her more general, like explosiveness with language and um, how meticulous she was with her work. Um, how it, it truly, truly was a craft and a practice. 
for her. I think those are things that I have certainly been influential on my work and my life as a writer. And uh, what do you find that people get the most wrong about Sylvia Plath? <clears throat> hmm. I think, yeah, you know, it's interesting. I was talking about this with my uh, PhD supervisor a few weeks ago, but I think that often people make the mistake of uh, reading her work as overly autobiographical. Certainly, you know, the, you know, con con the confessional mode was an important part of poetry of the time. But, um, <clears throat> you know, I think like she wasn't writing a diary. I mean, she kept a diary, obviously, but these poems are not her diary. These poems are her work, they're her craft, you know? And so I think that uh, when we all create something, we're drawing from what we know and what we feel and what we've experienced and what we see and observe. Um, and she's doing the same thing. But I think that sometimes people kind of just see it as like, a, oh, this is sort of like, you know, the sad circumstances of her life and her death. And like, we're sort of like seeing a, like a blow by blow of, you know, what that life was. And I, that's really not the case because, you know, she is an artist and an artisan, frankly, like any other creative. Now, what's next on in the writing world of Eileen Glenmore? Mm. Well, right now I am working on a collection of what I've been calling hybrid genre texts. So um, <clears throat> for me, this sort of encompasses any piece of writing that has an obviously lyrical impulse, but takes the shape of something other than lineated verse. So this could be a prose poem, a flash essay. Um, it could be sort of like a much longer graded lyric essay, playing with forms like the footnoting form that I mentioned earlier. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what I'm working on now. Well, that sounds incredible. And uh, I really want to thank you. I know that where you're in Zurich, it's about uh, 1.30 in the morning. So yes. you know, double <laughs> thanks for that. But please, uh, folks out there that are listening in or that are watching this feed, uh, pick up a copy of How Blood Works. Uh, it's a wonderful book and uh, it's available at all of your favorite independent bookstores as well as the uh, large corporate websites. So uh Thank you very, very much for uh, being with us tonight. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And for the folks that are tuning in on the Facebook feed, if uh, you would like to come into the open mic, just use the link. You're, you're welcome and I'll let you in. So uh, if not, um, I will say good night to you guys. <laughs>